This is obviously uh, in, the, in the Song of Songs, it's parabolic. It's Solomon singing. He's, this is actually a song. Singing to his beloved um, engaged, his betrothed. And this is what he's saying about her. This is what I believe Jesus is saying about us. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep, which have come up from the washing, every one of which bears twins, and none is barren among them. Uh, now, there's a lot in the Song of Songs we could study, but this is really talking about your ability to process the food of God, so the word, the teaching. Like, and he says, you got everything you need. Nothing's missing to eat everything I've got for you. Your lips are like a strand of scarlet. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built for an armory. He just sees the strength of your will to obey him. He sees it. On which a th hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which feed among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh, until the hill of frankincense. This is actually prophetically describing the way that Jesus felt when he went to the cross. He went to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. He went to the place of sacrifice and death to wait for us to be ready to love him and to be loved by him. That's what he's doing right now in our lives. He's waiting for us to feel loved by him, to feel like we literally fulfill this next part here. Okay. So he says, you are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. Come with me. From Lebanon, my spouse. Now, Lebanon is symbolic of pride. He's saying, come from pride. Come from feeling alone. Come from feeling like you have to do this on your own. Come from feeling like you got to be a strong tree. He says, come down from there with me. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Sinir and Hermon, from the lion's dance and from the mountains of leopards. You've ravished my heart. Now, she hasn't obviously come down yet. This is what he's saying to her. This is what he's saying to you. Come down from feeling all alone. Come down from this place of pride. Come down from thinking that being a strong cedar is what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is a cross. What I'm looking for is a sacrifice. Come down with me. You've ravished my heart. This is why. My sister, my spouse, you've ravished my heart with one look of your eyes, with one link of your necklace. You turn your head towards him, and he's like, I am ravished. How fair is your love, my sister, my spouse? How much better than wine is your love? Do you know right now Jesus is on a 2,000-year fast of wine? He said, I won't drink it again until I drink it anew with you at the wedding feast. He's literally refusing to drink wine until he's with you to drink it. He says, your love is better than wine. It's worth it, he says. And the scent of your perfumes and all spices, your lips, oh my spouse, drip as the honeycomb. He hangs on every word you say. Jesus literally hangs on every word you say. He listens to them all. He, every tear you've ever cried, he keeps in a bottle. Your lips on my spouse drip as a honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue, and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. So then he says this. He says, this is all true about how I feel about you. This is why I went to the cross. This is what I'm waiting for. I went to this mountain of myrrh, this hill of frankincense. Those are burial spices. He's like, I'm waiting in this place for you, but you're closed off. You're a garden enclosed. There's something inside of you. There's this life inside of you that Jesus, he wants to be a part of. He wants to lead it. He says, but your garden enclosed, my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. There's so much potential is what he would say. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits. Fragrant henna with spikenard, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes with all chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. Like the streams, when we, when we come down from Lebanon, like that's what the river does. It comes down out of the mountain. He's like, that's what I want. I want what flows out of you giving up your pride. I want what flows out of you giving up feeling like you're all alone. And then this is the response of the, of the bride-to-be. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south. Blow upon my garden that its spices may flow out. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruit. She says yes. Everything turns in this story when she says yes. If you've ever studied the Song of Songs, you know that that's not easy for the Shulamite when she says that, but it's beautiful and it's vibrant, and she suddenly knows what her groom is doing. That's what he's calling us to right now. He's saying, open up. 
let me in. I just want to come in. I just want to be your strength. I just want to tell you how amazing you are. I hang on every word of yours. I just want you to learn to hang on every word of mine. And Samantha prophesied, this yoke is easy. This burden is light. It just sounds too good to be true that God, the creator, the Genesis 1 creator God who spoke light into being and spoke the mountains around us and spoke the rivers into being, spoke the birds and the, the fish and people, that he literally wants to be with you. He wants to be with you. And this is really the point of the parable of the 10 bridesmaids, that there are five of the 10 that believe that. And they believe, when you really believe that Jesus wants to be with you, it frees you from all of the ways that you strive to be seen before people. The ways that we silently mostly reach for people to see us, to hear us, to believe that we're good, to believe that we're holy, to believe that we're worthwhile to believe our lives matter. When you feel like the Genesis 1 creator God not only sees you, not only decided to make you, but hangs on your every word, you get free from fearing what everybody else thinks about all your words, about the way you look, about how good your life has been, how well you've succeeded. You stop striving to be seen and recognized and heard because you know you are. And when the whole church enters into this freedom, this easy yoke, this light burden, what the world is going to get is a witness of selflessness. Right now, what the world is seeing is a ton of selfishness. And what that does is it's contagious. When you see people acting selfishly, typically you will start to act selfishly. Jesus wants a witness. Why do people do that? Why do we start to act selfishly when we see other people act selfishly? Because we start to think, oh no, I'm on my own. If I don't look out for number one, nobody else will. But that's not true. That's a scheme of the enemy to get you all alone. <laughs> that's what the enemy wants you to feel is all alone. That's a lie. God made you for a glorious purpose because he loves you. He knows every part about the way you think. And he still decided to pull you towards him. He knows all of the... the, the really negative ways that we think about life, we think about him, we think about others, and he still says, no, 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 I see something inside of you, you're guarded and closed, stopped up. If you will open up, I will help it all come out, and you'll be free. This is what he wants. He wants people that are free from anxiety and worry. He wants people that are free from striving and weariness and pain and rejection and discouragement. He wants people free from discouragement. But all of our attempts to try and be seen, to try and be heard, to try and look worthwhile, what they do is they leave us frustrated and empty and feeling alone. Because we were never supposed to do that. We were always supposed to be just who we are. Open, unashamed, who we are, so that God could partner with us and make us bright in light. And that's really the lamp that's being talked about in the parable of the Ten Bridesmaids. is this bright and shining witness that it's better to die to self and let God lead our lives than to try and strive and make something of ourselves. We live in a country that is literally in the, it's been corrupted into the foundation. It wasn't always in the foundation of America. The original foundation of America was, let's get out of this really safe kind of structured system that's oppressing us and telling us how we have to worship God. We don't like that. You know, King James was the one who wrote the, new, the, or the King James Version. He wasn't unreligious. He was very religious. In the, the first pilgrims, the people that left on the Mayflower, like they were looking for a place to risk it all and just love Jesus. Take their chances with what happened with the wild animals, the things they didn't know. But into the foundation is corrupted. This, this message has become corrupted to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Make something of yourselves. That's not what, the, the, that's not what founded this country. What founded this country was give yourself to God and see what happens. Not make something of yourselves. It's time for the church to give ourselves to God and see what happens. Stop fighting for God's kingdom to win because that's exactly the opposite of what God wants. God wants his kingdom to win inside of us, to open the gate and let him in. Now, the lamp is our witness of what is worth giving our lives to. The lamp and the parable of the ten bridesmaids. So in the parable of the ten bridesmaids, just to kind of catch you up, this is message seven, so I'm not going to read the parable because we've read it several times. But in the parable of the ten bridesmaids, the Lord says, at the time when people are deciding, is he coming, is he not coming? That's in Matthew 24. Some say he's delaying, and they start to treat other people poorly. Some say he's coming, and they try, try to give other people the right food at the right time. He says, at that time, the kingdom will be like this. Ten virgins, all waiting for their groom. 
Five are wise, five are foolish. They all fall asleep because the delay is very long. At midnight, a cry goes out. They all wake up. They all trim their lamps. The lamp is what we're talking about today. Is what does that mean to trim your lamp? Okay, so the, this is what the lamp is. It's your witness of what it's worth it to give your life to. Everybody thinks there's something worth giving their lives to. My dad, he was, he was a lot like me. He was a very one-track-minded guy. So he decided he liked bow hunting. I, remember, I think I was probably about four years old. And he got every bow magazine, bought every bow book, built his own bow, was all about, I mean, he just completely exhausted bow hunting for about six years. And then one day he just stopped bow hunting. He never bow hunted again after that. It just lost his interest. He picked up golf. He did golf literally day and night. He'd, in the wintertime in Michigan, he bought a net and put it in our garage and had a space heater in the garage, and he would hit balls into the net all winter long so that when spring came, he would be better at golf, and he became an amazing golfer. He's very good. For a factory guy, nobody ever taught him how to play golf. He's self-taught how to play golf. He's, you know, he'd play four over, three over all the time, like most of the time. He's really good. And then one day, he just stopped golfing. He exhausted it. Everything that you give yourself to that's not Jesus, you will eventually exhaust it. You will eventually find the end of it, and you'll leave discouraged, and you kind of forget about it, and you can't even remember why you liked it so much. Jesus is the one thing that will never leave you feeling that way. And if you have a one-track mind, that's a good thing. That's a gift from God as long as you point it at Jesus. And this is really what John the Baptist found out. Now, John the Baptist, we're about to read a little bit about him. He had many opportunities. He had many options. His dad was a priest in the, in the priesthood in Jerusalem. He had options to serve God. But instead, he gave himself to obeying God, and he ended up in the wilderness baptizing people in the Jordan River. He wore stuff that was different than all of the priests of his day. He ate stuff that was different than all. The priests were entitled to really good food. He ate stuff that was different than all the priests of his day. Because he had found the one thing that David had talked about. David said, one thing I desire, there's one thing I will seek. Now, David had a ton of opportunities himself. But this is the witness. This is the lamp that God is looking for in the earth right now. This is the, 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 the spirit of Elijah is what is promised to come to turn the hearts of fathers to children and children to fathers to start to turn people to God as the only reason to be alive. And he is. He's the only reason to be alive because he's the only source of life, okay? John 1, 1 to 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. So this is talking about Jesus, obviously. Er, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light, everybody say light, of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. This is the lamp in the parable of the ten bridesmaids. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for witness. Now this is John the Baptist. To bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. So John, he was, he was carrying a lamp with the light in it. He's actually the burning and shining lamp. We'll, we'll see that passage in a minute. That's what you're called to do. You're called to actually carry the life of Jesus in front of you to light the way. His word is a light, like it's a, it's a light to your path. He's actually supposed to be what's shining out of you. So if you have a good reputation and you're right with Jesus, Jesus has a good reputation through you and the world hates you. That's the way that that works because the world hated Jesus. So you, you're really never going to be a respectable Christian without a bunch of Christians not liking you. That's the only way that works. In the Bible, the, the witness of the Bible is true to that. You're never going to, if you try to get a reputation of your own, what you will find is you're rejected by God and you'll feel worn out and weary from trying to maintain your own reputation. It just doesn't work, okay? John figured this out. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, capital L, which gives light to every man coming into the world. This is the only hope is what that means. The only hope you have for having a successful life is to see that light and let yourself be drawn to it. But your flesh, what you think, what you feel, and what you want to do is naturally repelled by this light according to the Bible. It's only a miracle that, that we could be saved. It says unless God draws a man, you can't come to him. So the fact that we're interested in knowing God, that's miracle number one. And we, we should be saying that's a good light. <laughs> That is a good light. No matter what happens, that's a good light. That light is going to save me. Now, the whole darkness will fight against you that that light wouldn't save you. 
It's very tempting to give it into the darkness and then kind of be like, I just need a little light, just, a, just enough light to get saved. That's not possible. We need all the light. That's how you get saved is you come into the light. You're supposed to be bright and shining yourself according to Genesis. Okay. So he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, he to them, he gave the right to become children of God. Now he will reject anyone that doesn't come to the light. So you can't save people. If you believe in Jesus and he's filled you with his spirit and you believe that there's other people, they need to get saved. There's no other way to get saved except for the person individually decide to come to the light. You can just shine the light. It's unlawful for you to try to make people like the light. In fact, if you do that, what you end up doing is trying to cover up parts of the light that people find uncomfortable, so they will still come to the light and kind of get Jesus, and that's totally corrupt and called adulterous and unlawful. You got to give the full light that saved you is the full light that's going to save anybody else. You're mature enough to handle God telling you things that are hard, so is everybody else. It's just, do we want to be told things that are hard? That's the question. And if you don't want to be told things that are hard, then you don't get saved. Like, that's all there is to it. You got to change is kind of the idea. So as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh. That's why you can't save anybody. Nor of the will of man. That's why you can't convince anyone. But of God. That's the only way this light works. That's the only ones who will be saved. Those who are born of God. Born again is the way Jesus said it in John 3. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of, a, of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is unlike any other person to ever exist. And if we think about his personality traits, what made him unlike anyone else to ever exist, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Even under pressure, Jesus exhibited love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control, even when people want to kill him. Even when he knew more than anyone around him, he exhibited self-control by not convincing everybody of how smart he was. Even when everyone around him couldn't do the things he could do, he exercised the restraint of only doing what the Father told him to do. He literally could have done anything, but he only did what the Father told him to. Jesus laid down his life, in fact, and all that skill and all that ability and all that wisdom and all that knowledge, all that he made everyone that came against him. He literally, he literally formed in the womb every soul that crucified him. But he gave up all of his life for his father's desire. And he said, follow me. That's the only way to the father is if you give up all of your skill, all your ability, all your natural talent and leave it at the feet of the father and let him tell you how to use it and what to do with it. If you're willing to do that, he will make your life way more successful than you ever could have. He will make your reputation way more amazing. He'll write a name for you on a stone. It's like a monument in heaven that forever it will be a monument to who you are and how you loved him. But if you're short-sighted and you think he's not trustworthy, I better make something in my life right now. I better scrap out an existence. Usually if you're a religious person in his name, trying to do things that you think he likes, he will fully reject you. You will have no reputation. You'll be of no reputation. You will have nothing to show for. You'll have no fruit, nothing that makes it through the fire. That's what the end times are, a test to find out if you are light, if you've actually built your life on the jewels and the, the unperishable things that he gives you in the light of his glory. Philippians 2, 4 to 9. Don't look out for only your, for your own interest, only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. Now you could be like, well, you're just supposed to be selfish, not supposed to care about your own interest at all. That's not true. You can't do that. That's impossible. You can't be selfless. But what you can be is willing to be less selfish. And if you are willing to do that, Jesus will start to change you over time to be one with him. That's what you want. The flesh grits its teeth and says, okay, I'm just going to think about everybody else. It ends up making a mess of almost every relationship generally. Because you, what you think everybody else wants is generally what you want yourself. And you try to impose it on other people. And they're like, I don't want that. But if we're willing to let Jesus change us and actually make us more like him in situation by situation. And that means we make choices where we risk everything that we want on his leadership. We wait for position. We wait for honor. We actually trust in that taking the low place elevates us to the high place later on. But if you just assert and fight and claw, bite and devour one another, destruction is in your future. 
That's what you're signing up for is destruction. And many people right now under the guise of God's kingdom for political purposes start to try to devour and divide and destroy every enemy they see, not realizing they're agreeing with the kingdom of Satan. Because what Jesus wants is an internally peaceful, yielding, meek person that is available to God to do things no man would ever choose. If you could figure out how to save the world, we wouldn't need Jesus. God wouldn't have sacrificed his own perfect sinless son. So he says, don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. This is a daily thing that we have to do. We have to actually think, how do my actions affect the people around me? How does my just discouragement, me constantly voicing how discouraged I am, how does that affect the people around me? What is my con continual elation, my false elation? I'm just so happy. Everything's going to be great. How does that affect the people around me? They're like, no, it's actually, it's both. Like, it's kind of hard too. And you're really wearing me out with all your false positivity. Like, there are many things that we pick to do that damage the people around us. And we think, well, I'm doing it for God. And he's like, but I'm not telling you actually to do that. I might be playing a funeral song right now. It might be helpful to people to hear that you have some trouble too. I might be playing like the wedding song right now. It may be helpful to encourage somebody with some hope right now. But we have to know what God is saying and what God is doing. Does that make sense? So don't take an interest in yourself, but in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave, was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the highest, to the place of highest honor and gave him a name above all other names. So this risk of being like, okay, Jesus, what are we feeling right now? What do you want to do right now? What are you thinking about my situation? Are you thinking, wait? Or am I just feeling impatient? I prayed for a second. You didn't tell me no. So I'm like, God wants me to go. I'm just thinking of myself and all the things I want and running over people. If I'm doing that and slapping his name on it, then I'm actually counter to the very nature of Christ. I'm counter to the witness that the earth needs, that it's worth it to give myself to this man that I can't see, that I just have, I have this reach in my heart to know, and he's given me his word, and he's given me his spirit, and he's given me a community of people that also want to know him, but it's dim, and it takes faith, and I'm just trying. Do we have that kind of humility? Because this is the real humility of the great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 11. All the called... Start out self-interested. Every person that Jesus has ever called to be his disciple, they start out in the flesh is what that means. They start out thinking about themselves. But over time following him, we're supposed to actually see his personality and become less self-centered, less self-willed, less selfishly ambitious, and more yielded and more trusting and more mature, more like Jesus. So all the call, they start out self-interested. Your flesh is warring to stay self-interested and wants to hide that self-interest because we know that's not good. We all know selfishness isn't good. So we try to hide it by mixing it with godliness. This is literally the definition of biblical adultery. All the people that worship the Baals in, in Israel, all the people that were baking cakes to the queen of heaven, they never thought they had given up their trust in Jehovah. They just selfishly thought, I'm going to add to it. I'll mix it together. And God will know my real heart's intent is to trust him. But there's so much on the line and all these people are freaking out too. And if I don't do it, go along with them, then they're going to be, you know, there's all of this pressure from humanity to go along with humanity's impatient solutions to the things only God can fix. But that's called adultery in the Bible. Philippians 2, 19 to 21. This is, this is Paul. Speaking to the Philippian church, just a little bit later, after talking about Jesus not clinging to his own divine privileges, this is what he says. This is Paul. Just think about the church in Paul's day. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. He's like, all the people that I'm doing church with, they're selfishly interested. In fact, Paul broke from a ton of the brothers that we read about in the Bible. Because they had a will of their own. They did not want to yield to the illogical will of God. And he's like, I'm hoping Timothy will come to you and tell me how good you're doing because I got nobody like-minded with me that's willing to consider other people more than themselves. They just care about their position. They just care about being important. They just care about doing the things that they think God wants done. And if anybody gets in the way, they run over them rather than see the heart of Jesus, which is to yield to the Father in real time. That people shouldn't have to suffer for our exercising of our faith. 
that our understanding of prophecy should give us the heart of Jesus, meek, patient, long-suffering, kind, gentle. But oftentimes we think we hear the Lord and we just <laughs> run over everyone. And Paul's like, I'm looking for people that are like-minded with me. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Now, he, he did ministry with a lot of people. He's like, I got this guy, Timothy. Like, he's listening, and he wants to change. The chosen come out of self-interest, becoming convinced in faith that the Father wants a better life for us than we do. God actually has a better plan for your satisfaction than you do. You can exhaust the things that make sense to you and come up short and blame God and think Christianity doesn't work. A lot of people do it. But if you actually learn humility and to yield to God, you will never come up short. You will always come up becoming more, more capacity to feel the fellowship of suffering with Jesus. You'll feel vibrant in your life. You won't be spiritually bored. You'll find a reserve within you that you didn't put there to chase after God if you're willing to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and let him make you a self-controlled person. He wants to do that. He actually wants to impart self-control to us, to, let, to be unselfish, to stop jockeying for what we want. This, this idea of being self-interested in the name of Jesus, what it does is it creates a consumeristic church environment where people are like, it makes sense for me to go, so I'm going to go. Yes, there's something there for me. I'm getting something out of it. And if there's not, I'm, I'm going to look for somewhere else. That is, it's antithetical to the Bible. The Bible is talking about a commitment to people where you serve, where you learn that you, it's not all about you. Samantha said that to me yesterday on the boat. She said, it's not all about you. And the reason she said that to me is because I lost a fish. And I was like, we were having a discussion about how many fish have been lost. And I was like, I only lost two because they were talking about three being lost. And Sam said, it's not all about you. But that's what, I, I, and this, thank you for the yeah, because this is a real point. Shame will make you make things all about you. You start to think, how do people see me? Do they all think I lost two fish or do they think I lost three? Because I only lost two. And then suddenly the entire conversation is about you. Shame will do this to a company of people. It really will. Thank you, Sam, for pointing that out, that it wasn't all about me. The chosen come out of self-interest, becoming convinced in faith that the Father wants a better life for us than we do. Human nature is self-preservation. We naturally think ourselves is the only thing really worth giving our lives to. Though we don't verbalize that out loud generally. We'll like, I'll do the ministry thing because it makes me feel good. I always wanted to get victory over my fear of speaking in front of people. So I'll do the teaching and I'm, it's working. God's really working in my life. And it's, yeah, I have more opportunity. I just want more opportunity. And all of a sudden it becomes all about us. It's got nothing to do with what God called us to. There's all kinds of ways this happens. When God calls us, we take this nature, the self-interested nature that we all start with into the relationship. So that's what it means to be called. We come the way that we are, and you can only come the way that you are. But the chosen come out of self-interest. So many are called, few are chosen. And if you look in context, all the parables about many being called and few chosen, it's all about giving up self-interest. Oh, I've just bought these oxen. I've got to check out these things. I just got married. I have other things to do. And the, the, the father of the groom is like, kill that city. It's just a selfish place. But the chosen, they come out of self-interest, okay? We must come fully out of this nature that we were born with into readiness to let God be our reason for living, not our means of preserving our lives. God is not a nice add-on to your life. Jesus, like getting Jesus is not like, okay, I got that base covered. I finally got some religion. I have this relationship with Jesus. Now I can go have a really successful family, a great business, a good reputation. I got my life together. I'm off the drugs. I'm off the... That's not what being a Christian is about. Being a Christian is dying to your reputation to all of your ability to make a business good, to all of your ability to make a marriage good, to all of the things that you were trying to consume to make yourself feel good, dying to all that and living for Christ. That's it. That's it. This takes a lifetime to work out. Nobody does this on the front end. This happens by trial. This happens by judgment. This happens by breaking things. This happens by sitting with your eyes closed before a God who's invisible and letting him speak to you and then believing it when it's confirmed in the word and confirmed by the other people you know that are going after him. This comes by being humble and being correctable, being teachable. Not just by showing up trying to get what you want from the place and thinking God's really happy with you because you showed up, that he really appreciated it. He doesn't. We should appreciate it. 
He did so much to call us. Like, it's a miracle that we're even being called at all. So we can't see God as a, as a means to preserving our lives. We have to see God as the reason for our lives. Reputation is godly people. This is a way that we use God to make our lives better. We think if I sound like somebody who knows something about the Bible, I know something about God, I have this reputation as a godly person. Or I give my money away. Jesus said, do it secretly. Otherwise, you lose your reward. But the flesh says, no, let people know how generous you are. Like, you want people, you know, you do it tricky. You're real careful about how you let it be known, but, you know, kind of let it be known. Helpful, kind, holy. All these things can be corrupted into being self-serving instead of God-serving. Would you, would you serve if there was no honor in it, no glory in it? If no one came to any of your meetings, would you still do it? If nobody cared, if nobody ever found out how much money you gave away, would you still give it away? If nobody knew the secret places where you're making choices to resist sin, or do you just do it when you think you might get found out? Like, are we making choices to live unto Christ? This is the lamp. That, now listen to me. In the pressure in the world right now, there's so much, so much selfishness. It's very tempting to be selfish and be like, if I don't carve out my time now, if I don't show people who I am now, I'm going to miss it. If I don't get what I need right now, this is what Samantha was talking about with the mark of the beast. If I don't take care of me right now, I'm going to be in trouble because that's not a trustworthy God. But he is a trustworthy God. And if you died, if you starved to death and you died, your soul would not perish in hell if you were his. But you could save your little tummy right now and still have a soul hungry in hell for billions and billions and billions of years because you wouldn't trust him. You could save your body from death. But if you weren't trusting him to do it, you would still perish in a lake of fire forever. The short-term thinking that we have, that we have an untrustworthy God, yes, I love him, yes, I believe in him, yes, I will give myself to him someday. But right now, I've got to take care of what needs getting taken care of. You will perish in a lake of fire forever. The whole point is to learn to trust God now with what you've got to risk now. And there are very few things you actually have to risk. Your money, your health, your relationships, and your relationship with God. That's really what you've got to risk. Those are the things we tend to try to control. That we try to be seen as somebody who's got it together and is doing okay in those areas, typically. Ministry with honor, accomplishment in music or education or revelation, conquering our fears, our bucket list of things we always wanted to try. I'm getting to try those in the name of Jesus. Personal growth. He just wants me to become a better person. No, he wants you to die. He literally wants your personality to die so he can lead you to life because you don't know how to get there. And if you could get there on your own, he wouldn't have, he, God wouldn't have let his son die on a cross. You can't get there. He's not trying to, like, renovate your personality the way it is. He's trying to destroy it so he can renovate your being. Your being. Your personality is born going to hell. And he gave a perfect personality as a sacrifice. Never should have suffered anything. Infinitely unjust that he would die, that he would be mocked. Infinitely unjust that anybody would even try to teach him. Do you understand that the fact that religious leaders tried to teach God is just as unjust as them putting a nail through his hand? It's just as ridiculous. We have to be a humble people that see the nature of God, that have a holy fear of who he is. So we can humble ourselves under his hand and give ourselves to him and tell him, I'm not okay being selfish. But everybody starts selfish. It's just, are we okay with it? Do we say, well, that's just my personality, my needs. It's just the way I kind of am. Everybody kind of is. But the chosen come out of it. They actually tell them they're not okay with it. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 7. I could speak, if I could speak, all the languages of the earth and of the angels, but didn't love others, I'd only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. You could literally know heavenly language, but if, you, if it wasn't led by a desire to die to self and love others, it would be just noise. I, if I had the gift of prophecy, if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move the mountains, isn't that what God's looking for? The faithful that could move the mountains. No, it's not. This is what he's looking for. But didn't love others, I'd be nothing. How many compromises do we make in the church for people that seem to have some spiritual power? 
some spiritual authority, some good teaching. Hey, they have miracles. They're healing people. Yeah, let's ignore all their selfish ambition, their pride, the way they promote themselves, put their, their picture on every single document they ever make. Let's ignore all that. But they got their healing. They must be of God. No, according to this, no. It's a waste if it's all about you. It's a complete and utter pouring out of Jesus' precious blood on the ground and kicking dust on it and not caring at all what it was for which was to remake this internal process into humble people that wanted a God, that wanted to be led, that wanted to be weak, that wanted to need a Savior. Do you want to need a Savior? Do you want to look like somebody who's got it all together? Mostly we want to, I mean, I don't know about you, but me, I mostly want to look like I got it all together. And he's like, come out of that, my people. Come out of that Babylonian thinking. Come into my presence. Be weak, be needy, don't be afraid. You don't have to be afraid of the mark of the beast. You don't have to be afraid of the darkness in the night, the pestilence in the, in the day. You 10,000 could fall at your right, 10,000 at your left. But if you're under the shadow of the most high, you don't have to be afraid of anything. But all we're seeing, we're seeing a culture in the church growing. Fear of this enemy, fear that's all a whisper of who the enemy might be. We don't even know who the enemy is. Just fear growing, 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 and no dying to self. No taking a risk. What have we got to lose? It's all dying anyway. What have we got to lose? Do we want to meet him having preserved our lives to have him send us to a lake of fire? Or would we rather give up our lives and meet him and say, well done. Good job. But it's counter to this culture. It's counter to the church culture. It's counter to the world culture and it's counter to the love culture of this planet. And if you do what I'm describing, people will say you hate the world. If you don't cooperate with the world's plans to save lives, but there you have to pick. You have to pick self-preservation or death to self and godly preservation. There's no other choice. No other choice on planet Earth. If I gave everything I have to the poor, this is what he's talking about. This is what it means. I could give all of my money to the poor. Well, that's going to save some lives, Tom. There's some people starving. You know, the people need more money. They can't pay their bills. They're stressed out. People are committing suicide. He says, I could give everything I have to the poor, even sacrifice my body. That's not love. I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is doing what God says. He is love. He's the source of all love. Obeying God. Learning to stop looking like somebody that love, uh, loves others and actually loving them, telling them the truth in love. We would much rather be people that look like we love others and let somebody else do the hard conversation. That's why everybody loves a pastor, honestly. Nobody wants to have the hard conversation themselves. They just want to blame somebody. It's very hard to have a church with no pastor because you've got nobody to blame. You will find someone to blame if it's in your heart to do that. But we have to be a people that come out of that thinking. We have to be a people that are like, no, I'm going to learn how to do the difficult things. I'm going to actually learn to trust Jesus and love people and not just look like somebody who loves people. Not just look like I go along and get along. That's evil. That's evil. This is the lamp that's being talked about in the ten bridesmaids. So when you see Jesus like, at that time, there's going to be this thing, and they're going to trim the lamp, and some people's lamps are going to go out. They're going to be like, give me some of that fuel. How do you keep living this selfless witness when there's all of this pressure? Do you know the pressure that's coming is much more than we're experiencing right now? There will be so much more pressure for the mark of the beast than you ever have seen with the vaccine. The vaccine was like a, God threw like a soft underhand pitch to say, you know, are you guys going to swing? The mark of the beast is going to be like, you're killing your kids. You hate the children of the earth if you don't cooperate with this. It takes complete cooperation for this currency to work. Otherwise, you're part of a black market that's devaluing and breaking everything. Are you, the, are you ready to do that? I don't think you are, personally. I'm not. This doesn't happen when it, we need it. That's the parable of the ten bridesmaids. It doesn't happen at midnight when you wake up. You're like, oh, dang, <laughs> the light's going out. You have, you have wisdom before that happens, before that's needed. We have so many opportunities today to be selfless, unafraid. Stop trying to make something of ourselves. Stop trying to be somebody that everybody sees as okay and got it together. Because I'm telling you, the Christians in Hebrews 11, they were sawn in two, put in prison. They were the trash of the earth. And, and the writer of Hebrews says the earth wasn't worthy of them. Are you ready to be a person that's the trash of the earth? I don't think so. I'm not. That's why we come here. This is what we're doing. 
That's the whole point of being here is to get something burning in here that is not like the world, that isn't just selfish ambition with Jesus' name slammed on it. Hey, can I have a meeting? Hey, can I do this? Hey, can I do that? Hey, this is my chance to shine. That's not the shining he's looking for. The shining he's looking for, it's the person who takes the low place at the wedding. He says, come up here with me. But if you do what I'm saying in the flesh, then you will try to find the broom and go to the basement and try to sweep the basement. You're like, Jesus, look at me, how humble I am. That's not what that's about. It's about Jesus. What are you saying about my ambition that's going like crazy, this wild craziness in here that it just frustrates me when I talk to people that I think have the opportunities I want and I just burn inside. I can't take it. That's what it's talking about is what do we do with that emotion? What do we do with that selfish ambition that's hidden, that no one sees, that fire burning in us that no one sees? That's a negative lamp. And he's like, let's put that thing out. You can't put it out yourself. You're not a bad person if you feel like I described. Otherwise, I'm a bad person. I guess we're all bad people. We need a savior. We need a savior. We need a different light. We need the light of mankind. We need a light that came from somewhere else that shines an entirely different value system, an entirely different kingdom system. We need to extinguish the self-light, the, the strange fire, the sparks that are our own, and tell him, I need a different light. I need a different value. I need to actually value the low place, the hidden place, the secret place. I need to value that you see me and I ravish your heart, but it's so hard to touch. It's so hard to touch Jesus, how much you love me until I get rid of the other things that are clamoring in my heart to be seen and to be heard and to be loved. And I just let you speak to me. That's the point of a prayer room. That's the point of a prayer room. But I'll tell you, This is the point of conflict. Because this is the place you get what I'm describing, this is where the war happens. Because Satan, he's out, he's out, man. Two to one. So you can expect that when you walk in this room intending to be selfless, that selfishness rises up. This is what Paul said in Romans. What a wretched man I am. I don't do the things I want to do. I do the things I don't want to do. Who will save me? Thank God for Jesus. He will save you if you are willing to be true, to admit I walked in here thinking about how I looked. I actually walked in here all ashamed of what people are going to think about what I was about to do. So I used 8,000 more words to describe why I did it wrong. I just kind of sucked so much air out of the room just being about, I'm not talking about you. I'm literally, I'm talking about me. I'm talking about me for the last 10 years. If you can relate, thank God that you're hearing something that will help you. But I just gave all the 100,000 reasons why I didn't do it as great as I probably could have. That's all pride. We came here to admit we can't do it. We came here to be needy, to have a savior, a different leader, a different strength, a different light, a different light. You see, that's, this is the lamp that's being talked about. John 5, 30 to 36. I can do nothing. I can of myself do nothing. This is what Jesus said. This is the Son of Man, the Word. All things were made through him. I'm on page two of the notes, but I'm halfway down. I can of myself do nothing. Jesus, are you telling the truth? Yes. He's telling the truth. He doesn't lie. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous. Now, was Jesus just being like, kind of like winking at his disciples? I can of myself do nothing? No. He was perfect in the flesh. This is what the flesh should be like. This is what God wants from our flesh, that it admits it's dust. Without God, there's no life in you. You're literally a lump of clay. That's what Adam was before God was breathed into Adam. Jesus was just true. I got dust. I I decided with the Father to take on dust. I can do nothing on my own. That's what I decided to do. It was his decision to make. He continually decided to stay in the place. He was tempted in every way that you are. Every single way. He suffered everything that you could possibly suffer. All the feelings to want to grab and go and be seen. He, he despised the shame. He went to the cross despising the shame. In his flesh, he had a reason to offer all the reasons. This should not be happening, did he? No. He said, don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves. Cry for yourselves. The thief on the cross, the only witness that he didn't deserve it, the thief next to him said, we deserve it. He didn't. And what did Jesus say? Thankfully, somebody told, no. 
He said, you'll be with me today in paradise. You'll be with me today in paradise. Jesus despised the shame. It wasn't that he didn't feel it. He was literally naked on a cross, nailed. God, the only person on the planet that didn't deserve it. And he was thinking about the guy who was like, it's just wrong. Are we thinking this? When we walk into a sanctuary, are we thinking about him? Are we thinking about his glory, his honor, who he is, what he deserves? Or are we mostly thinking about how we look, how we feel, our opportunity, what we've done, how we're not noticed, how we haven't been, how, you see what I'm saying? If you feel these things in this place, then you know you're in the right place. This is where that changes. This is where the war happens. This is where we admit it. This is where we become clean. This is where we get washed in the blood of the lamb. So I'm not condemning anyone. I'm telling you, you came to the right place to deal with it if you're willing to deal with it. But you got to deal with it. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to, everybody say it, John, and he has borne witness to the truth. This is what the earth is clamoring for right now, is the spirit of Elijah, a witness of this, a witness that it's not all about us. It's not about the kingdom winning. It's not about the church advancing. It's, it's about us glorifying the fact that we need a savior, and he's got a really unique plan to do that. He's going to actually bring a war against the church, a 42-month war against the saints. He's going to let the antichrist prevail over them to get as many as are humble and are willing to admit it. We need a savior. And he says in Luke 18, 7 to 8, will I not avenge my own elect who cry out to me day and night, though I bear long with them? That's what this is all about. You came to the right place to tell God you need a savior. And he will avenge his own elect, and he will do it speedily. But will he find faith? Will he find the lamp of faith on the planet when he comes? Not if I don't change, and not if you don't change. And that's why we're here. We're here to need a Savior. We're here to be helpless. We're here to be heard. But it's him that needs to be heard, not us. We're here to be a witness that's what that means. When you're a witness, you're testifying of something that you've seen and that you've heard. But we're mostly a witness of our own shame, our own lack, and all the reasons why it's still okay. And that will cut you off. That's a garden enclosed. And he's like, I see inside there's a fountain of gardens. Henna and fragrant spikenard, milk and honey. There's so much inside if you would just be you. Just be needy, old, don't know what you're doing, you telling God how much you need God. And he's like, I will change the entire planet with you. That's everybody you read about in this book. That's what they did. They were just them, needing God. We're like, that was so great that David did that. So great that Daniel did that. And then we just try to cover up all of our lack and our need and our shame and try to act like good Christians, put on the Christian face. It's awful. It really is. Yet I do not receive a testimony from man. So he says, you sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. John is the burning, shining lamp. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, John, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. Did John's light extinguish under pressure? Why did John's light not extinguish under pressure? Thank you, Brother Tim. Why did John endure right until the decapitation of John? What was John doing that was different than everybody else of his day? Was he eating anything different? Yep. Was he living anywhere different? Was he saying anything different? Did people really love him? Nope. Did they come listen to him? Yep. Did they receive him? Did he get a lot of likes on Facebook? When he, did, when he got like one like, and he was like, Jesus, I think that was you. He's like, I'm done. Do you know Jesus, he, if you're writing something that he told you to, he liked it? Do you see his like? Was John living for the popularity of the world? Was he living for the life of the world? Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Because Jesus is the light of mankind. In him is the life. He was living for the life of the world. 
He was a witness. You've got to come off of this thing. You've got to get off of this ride. You've got to come out. We have to come out. Now, this is the deception that you're not going to take the mark of the beast, that you're not going to worship the image of the beast, that you're not going to go into Babylon. You're in Babylon. You're already there. Everybody called is called out of Babylon. The chosen come out. You're already taking the mark of the beast. Turn with me for a second to Revelation 13. In your Bible, if you don't have one, there's one in front of you or somewhere next to you in a chair. We're going to end right here. Revelation 13. A good friend of mine was preaching about this last week. Revelation 13, 16. Actually, Revelation 13, 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. He looked like, a, he looked like Jesus, but he spoke like Satan. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs, so that he even makes fire come down from heaven and the earth in the sight of men, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth. He deceives them. It's not, he's not like, hey, I'm the false prophet. Everybody who's, who wanted the false prophet bus, get on my bus. No, he will try to appear to be a real prophet. That's why he's calling on fire. He's this false, a false, a, a pseudo spirit of Elijah. That's literally what he is. And many will love him. Anyone who loves the world will love him. Believers who love the world and the things in it will love the false prophet. They really will. He performs great signs so that even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many who would not, as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. They're looking for worshipers. <laughs> Satan's looking for worshipers. Where does Satan go when he's looking for worshipers? The church. He went to Jesus. Worship me. I'll give you all of it. He goes right to the place where he wants the worship. This is talking about the church, whether you know it or not. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or, everybody say or, the name of the beast. Everybody say or, the number of his name. I'm going to read that one more time. No one may buy or sell except one who has the mark, everybody say or, the name, the number. We're in a culture that is saturated with the mark of the beast. We've just turned it into a tattoo or a chip or biometrics or whatever we think it is. But you've got to come out of Babylon. This is the Babylonian economy. This is where Babylon's economy is going. That's all that this is. If you read in Revelation 14, you're going to see. He says, come out of Babylon if you take the mark. It's, this is a Babylonian reality. You can just actually look on the very next column of the page and see. The mark of the beast is just the currency of Babylon. What's on your dollar on the back? You see any symbols there? You got to come out of the love of this thing. You got to come out of the pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You got to come out of everything that has become corrupt. Babylon was the once golden city, but she's become a haunted demon. That's the story of Babylon in the Bible. We actually have to come out of a selfish identity that glorifies us in the name of Jesus. That's what mostly you're going to see on Facebook right now. But it has to be the difficult things that John the Baptist said that don't get a lot of likes, that don't get a lot of love of the world, but they get you, they get you a ravished heart in heaven. One glance from you has ravished his heart. Stephan and, and Paul, you guys want to come back up? One link of your necklace, it's moved his heart. This is the lamp that's going to extinguish for about, I guess, let's just say statistically, 50% of the people that are going hard after Jesus looking for his return. We just take that parable seriously, and I don't think that that's good mathematically. But I think it's good from a heart posture to say, I got a 50-50 chance 
of actually staying faithful through what's coming, I want to, I want to skew my odds. How do you skew your odds? Wisdom. Giving other servants the right food at the right time. This is what Jesus says about the parable of the ten bridesmaids. I'm going to read it to you while these guys are getting set up. This is in Matthew 24. So that at that time, he says, then the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 25, and he gives the parable of the ten bridesmaids. He says, this is the time that this parable is about. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. If you want wisdom, if you want a lamp that endures, if you want to shine, shine right now. Burn right now with the witness that it's not about me. It's not about what I can or cannot do. It's not about how people see me. It's not about the sum total of my life. It's not. You're going to live for billions and billions and billions of years. Whether or not you were financially successful, whether or not you were successful in any relationship, whether or not you were successful in anything that people would judge, you won't think about unless it's all you think about. Then it's all you'll think about. That's all you'll have. You'll have nothing else. You'll be disconnected from God. You'll just be thinking about failure forever. But you can think about God. You can think on what's beautiful and what's lovely. You can give yourself to him. So let me read the rest of this. Let's stand together. Blessed is that servant who is master when he comes will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you, he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunk, it's just as selfish. He's a servant, yes, but he's a selfish servant. He just came to take. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you want to feel loved by God, I feel like that's the need he wants to address in this room. To feel what we look like in his sight. And he he thinks you are beautiful. He thinks you are perfectly made. Some of you have parents that told you you weren't perfectly made. Some of you had friends that said just one thing and it set you off on a trajectory that messed you up. And you've been trying to prove something ever since. And that very trying to prove has led you to a place you never wanted to be in the first place. Because you could never prove you weren't not something. Holy Spirit, in this room, would you show us how you love us, how we're fearfully and wonderfully made? Would you touch us with a spirit of revelation about what we were made for? That we were made for you. We were made for you, Jesus. We are safe in your hands. We can take the plunge off that cliff with you. You will catch us. God, Holy Spirit, in this room, pour out confidence in love. If you want that, just tell them, I want confidence in your love. That would open the gate of our hearts, Lord, and let you in more. He says, some of you are just tired. You're just tired of exhausting all the things you thought life was about. He says, I am not tired. I will help you. I will give you the breath of life. I will fill you. Open your heart. Holy Spirit, we just say, north wind, blow. South wind, blow. Whatever you think is good for our lives, God, blow. Let its spices come out. Let its fragrance come out. Come into the garden. Have what you want. We'll just, I'd rather take my chances with what you want than keep telling you what I want. In Jesus' name, amen.